Walt Whitman has somewhere a fine and just distinction between loving by allowance and loving with personal love. This distinction applies to books as well as to men and women. And in the case of the not very numerous authors who are the objects of the personal affection, it brings a curious consequence with it. There is much more difference as to their best work than in the case of those others who are loved by allowance by convention, and because it is felt to be the right and proper thing to love them. And in the sect, fairly large and yet unusually choice, of Austinians or Janites, there would probably be found partisans of the claim to primacy of almost every one of the novels. To some the delightful freshness and humour of Northanger Abbey, its completeness, finish and entrain, obscure the undoubted critical facts that its scale is small and its scheme, after all, that of burlesque or parody, a kind in which the first rank is reached with difficulty. Persuasion, relatively faint in tone and not enthralling in interest, has devotees who exalt above all the others its exquisite delicacy and keeping. The catastrophe of Mansfield Park is admittedly theatrical. The hero and heroine are insipid, and the author has almost six wickedly destroyed all romantic interest by expressly admitting that Edmund only took Fanny because Mary shocked him, and that Fanny might very likely have taken Crawford if he had been a little more assiduous. Yet the matchless rehearsal scenes and the characters of Mrs. Norris and others have secured, I believe, a considerable party for it. Sense and Sensibility has perhaps the fewest out-and-out -out admirers, but it does not want them, I suppose, however, that the majority of at least competent votes would, all things considered, be divided between Emma and the present book, and perhaps a, the vulgar verdict, if indeed a fondness for Miss Austen be not of itself a patent of exemption from any possible charge of vulgarity, would go for Emma, it is the larger, the more varied, the more popular. The author had by the time of its composition seen rather more of the world, and had improved her general, though not her most peculiar and characteristic dialogue. Such figures as Miss Bates, as the Eltons, cannot but unite the suffrages of everybody. On the other hand, I may, for my part, declare for pride and prejudice unhesitatingly. It seems to me the most perfect, the most characteristic, the most eminently quintessential of its author's works, and for this contention in such narrow space as is permitted to me, I propose here to show cause. In the first place, the book it may be barely necessary to remind the reader, was in its first shape written very early, somewhere about 796, when Miss Austen was barely twenty-one. Though it was revised and finished at Chawton some fifteen years later, and was not published till 1813, only four years before her death, I do not know whether, in this combination of the fresh and vigorous projection of youth and the critical revision of middle life, there may be traced the distinct superiority in point of construction, which, as it seems to me, it possesses over all the others. The plot, though not elaborate, is almost regular enough for fielding. Hardly a character, hardly an incident could be retrenched without loss to the story. The elopement of Lydia and Wickham is not like that of Crawford and Mrs. Rushworth, a coup de siatre. It connects itself in the strictest way with the course of the story earlier, and brings about the denouement with complete propriety. All the minor passages, the loves of Jane and Bingley, the advent of Mr. Collins, the visit to Hunsford, the Derbyshire tour, fit in after the same unostentatious but masterly fashion. There is no attempt at the hide-and-seek in and out business which in the transactions between Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax contributes no doubt a good deal to the intrigue of Emma, but contributes it in a fashion which I do not think the best feature 
of that otherwise admirable book. Although Miss Austen always liked something of the misunderstanding kind, which afforded her opportunities for the display of the peculiar and incompatible talent to be noticed presently, she has been satisfied here with the perfectly natural occasions provided by the false account of Darcy's conduct given by Wickham and by the awkwardness arising with equal naturalness from the gradual transformation of Elizabeth's own feelings from positive aversion to actual love. I do not know whether the all-grasping hand of the playwright has ever been laid upon pride and prejudice, and I dare say that if it were, the situations would prove not startling or garish enough for the footlights, the character scheme too subtle and delicate for pit and gallery. But if the attempt were made, it would certainly not be hampered by any of those loosenesses of construction which, sometimes disguised by the conveniences of which the novelist can avail himself, appear at once on the stage. I think, however, though the thought will doubtless seem heretical to more than one school of critics, that construction is not the highest merit, the choicest gift of the novelist. It sets off his other gifts and graces most advantageously to the critical eye, and the want of it will sometimes mar those graces, appreciably, though not quite consciously, to eyes by no means ultra-critical. But a very badly built novel which excelled in pathetic or humorous character, or which displayed consummate command of dialogue, perhaps the rarest of all faculties, would be an infinitely better thing than a faultless plot acted and told by puppets with pebbles in their mouths, and despite the ability which Miss Austen has shown in working out the story, I, for one, should put pride and prejudice far lower if it did not contain what seemed to me the very masterpieces of Miss Austen's humour and of her faculty of character creation. Masterpieces who may indeed admit John Thorpe, the Eltons, Mrs. Norris, and one or two others to their company, but who, in one instance certainly, and perhaps in others, are still superior to them. The characteristics of Miss Austen's humour are so subtle and delicate that they are, perhaps, at all times easier to apprehend than to express, and at any particular time likely to be differently apprehended by different persons. To me this humour seems to possess a greater affinity, on the whole, to that of Addison than to any other of the numerous species of this great British genius. The differences of scheme, of time, of subject, of literary convention, are, of course, obvious enough. The difference of sex does not, perhaps, <clears throat> count for much, for there was a distinctly feminine element in Mr. Spectator, and in Jane Austen's genius there was, though nothing mannish, much that was masculine. But the likeness of quality consists in a great number of common subdivisions of quality. Demureness, extreme minuteness of touch, avoidance of loud tones, and glaring effects. Also there is in both a certain not inhuman or unamiable cruelty. It is the custom with those who judge grossly to contrast the good nature of Addison with the savagery of Swift, the mildness of Miss Austen with the boisterousness of Fielding and Smollett, even with the ferocious practical jokes that her immediate predecessor, Miss Burney, allowed without very much protest. Yet both in Mr. Addison and in Miss Austen, there is, though a restrained and well-mannered, an insatiable and ruthless delight in roasting and cutting up a fool. A man in the early eighteenth century, of course, could push this taste further than a lady in the early nineteenth, and no doubt Miss Austen's principles, as well as her heart, would have shrunk from such things as the letter from the unfortunate husband in The Spectator, who describes, with all the gusto and all the innocence in the world, how his wife and his friend induce him to play at blind man's buff. But another Spectator letter, 
that of the damsel of fourteen who wishes to marry Mr. Shapley and assures her selected mentor that he admires your spectators mightily, might have been written by a rather more ladylike and intelligent Lydia Bennet in the days of Lydia's great-grandmother, while, on the other hand, some, I think unreasonably, have found cynicism in touches of Miss Austen's own, such as her satire of Mrs. Musgrove's self-deceiving regrets over her son. But this word, cynical, is one of the most misused in the English language, especially when, by a glaring and gratuitous falsification of its original sense, it is applied not to rough and snarling invective, but to gentle and oblique satire. If cynicism means the perception of the other side, the sense of the accepted hells beneath, the consciousness that motives are nearly always mixed, and that to seem is not identical with to be, if this be cynicism, then every man and woman who is not a fool, who does not care to live in a fool's paradise, who has knowledge of nature and the world and life, is a cynic, and in that sense Miss Austen certainly was one. She may even have been one in the further sense that, like her own Mr. Bennet, she took an epicurean delight in dissecting, in displaying, in setting at work, her fools and her mean persons. I think she did take this delight, and I do not think at all the worse of her for it as a woman, while she was immensely the better for it as an artist. In respect of her art generally, Mr. Goldwyn Smith has truly observed that metaphor has been exhausted in depicting the perfection of it, combined with the narrowness of her field, and he has justly added that we need not go beyond her own comparison to the art of a miniature painter. To make this latter observation quite exact, we must not use the term miniature in its restricted sense, and must think rather of membling at one end of the history of painting and Meissonier at the other, than of Cosway or any of his kind, and I am not so certain that I should myself use the word narrow in connection with her. If her world is a microcosm, the cosmic quality of it is at least as eminent as the littleness. She does not touch what she did not feel herself called to paint. I am not so sure that she could not have painted what she did not feel herself called to touch. It is at least remarkable that in two very short periods of writing, one of about three years and another of not much more than five, she executed six capital works and has not left a single failure. It is possible that the romantic paste in her composition was defective. We must always remember that hardly anybody born in her decade, that of the 18th century seventies, independently exhibited the full romantic quality. Even Scott required Hill and Mountain and Ballad, even Coleridge Metaphysics and German, to enable them to chip a classical shell. Miss Austen was an English girl brought up in a country retirement. At the time when ladies went back into the house, if there was a white frost which might pierce their kids' shoes, when a sudden cold was the subject of the gravest fears, when their studies, their ways, their conduct were subject to all those fantastic limits and restrictions against which Mary Wollstonecraft protested with better general sense than particular taste or judgment. Miss Austen, too, drew back when the white frost touched her shoes. But I think she would have made a pretty good journey even in a black one. For if her knowledge was not very extended, she knew two things which only genius knows. The one was humanity, and the other was art. On the first head, she could not make a mistake. Her men, though limited, are true, and her women are, in the old sense, absolute. As to art, if she has never tried idealism, her realism is real, to a degree which makes the false realism of our own day look merely dead alive. Take almost any Frenchman, except the late Monsieur de Maupassant, 
and watch him laboriously piling up strokes in the hope of giving a complete impression, you get none. You are lucky if, discarding two-thirds of what he gives, you can shape a real impression out of the rest. But with Miss Austen, the myriad, trivial, unforced strokes build up the picture like magic. Nothing is false, nothing is superfluous. When, to take the present book only, Mr. Collins changed his mind from Jane to Elizabeth while Mrs. Bennet was stirring the fire, and we know how Mrs. Bennet would have stirred the fire when Mr. Darcy brought his coffee cup back himself. The touch in each case is like that of Swift, taller by the breadth of my nail, which impressed the half-reluctant Thackeray with just and outspoken admiration. Indeed, fantastic as it may seem, I should put Miss Austen as near to Swift in some ways as I have put her to Addison in others. His Swiftian quality appears in the present novel as it appears nowhere else in the character of the immortal, the ineffable Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins is really great, far greater than anything Addison ever did, almost great enough for Fielding or for Swift himself. It has been said that no one ever was like him, but in the first place he was like him. He is there, alive, imperishable, more real than hundreds of prime ministers and archbishops, of metals, semi-metals, and distinguished philosophers. In the second place it is rash, I think, to conclude that an actual Mr. Collins was impossible or non-existent at the end of the eighteenth century. It is very interesting that we possess, in this same gallery, what may be called a spoiled first draft, or an unsuccessful study of him in John Dashwood. The formality, the underbreeding, the meanness are there. But the portrait is only half alive, and is felt to be even a little unnatural. Mr. Collins is perfectly natural and perfectly alive. In fact, for all the miniature, there is something gigantic in the way in which a certain side, and more than one, of humanity, and especially eighteenth-century humanity, its philistinism, its well-meaning but hide-bound morality, its formal pettiness, its groveling respect for rank, its materialism, its selfishness, receives exhibition. I will not admit that one speech or one action of this inestimable man is incapable of being reconciled with reality, and I should not wonder if many of these words and actions are historically true. But the greatness of Mr. Collins could not have been so satisfactorily exhibited if his creatress had not adjusted so artfully to him the figures of Mr. Bennet and of Lady Catherine de Bourg. The latter, like Mr. Collins himself, has been charged with exaggeration. There is, perhaps, a very faint shade of colour for the charge, but it seems to me very faint indeed. Even now I do not think that it would be impossible to find persons, especially female persons, not necessarily of noble birth, as overbearing, as self-centred, as neglectful of good manners, as Lady Catherine. A hundred years ago an earl's daughter, the lady powerful, if not exactly bountiful, of an out-of-the-way country parish, rich, long out of marital authority, and so forth, had opportunities of developing these agreeable characteristics which seldom present themselves now. As for Mr. Bennet, Miss Austen, and Mr. Darcy, and even Miss Elizabeth herself were, I am inclined to think, rather hard on him. For the impropriety of his conduct, his wife was evidently, and must always have been, a quite irreclaimable fool, and unless he had shot her or himself, there was no way out of it for a man of sense and spirit, but the ironic, from no other point of view, is he open to any reproach except for an excusable and not unnatural helplessness at the crisis of the elopement, and his utterances are the most acutely delightful in the consciously humorous kind, in the kind that we laugh with. Not Etty, that even Miss Austen 
as put into the mouth of any of her characters.